Okay, hello everybody. So uh, welcome to this final session of the um, um, of the online MPI course. So hopefully you should see I've just typed something into the chat. That should all work okay. And you should see the slide which Claire has put up. Um, and I'm just going to start just about now sharing the um, um, the solution to the ring example. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll First of all, I will just briefly recap what the, the, the ring sum example was. So I will just share the, um, the sheet from last week, if I can. Um, be able to do that. Okay, so you should see the, I'm going to get the exercise sheet, which is up at the top. And so this was the example, was to basically rotate information around a ring. And this is the classic situation where you get deadlock if you, if you don't use, um, if you use synchronous send, because we've, we've got a periodic domain, a periodic um, arrangement of processes, and everybody is sending to their neighbor. But what we want to do, we're going to use this simple, very simple method to add up all these numbers, A, B, C, and D. We go through four steps, or in general, in P processes, there's P steps. Um, and at each step, each process passes uh, data to its neighbor and receives data from its other neighbor and accumulates it locally. And there were two um, um, there were two examples here. One was to um, add up um, the, the value p, and you should get the answer. So if, if each if each process sorry initializes its data to the rank then you will get p, p minus 1 over 2. But if it initializes to the rank plus 1 squared, you get um, some other number. So um, the solutions are actually up there already. If you go to the top of the, of the um, I'll try and leave this. If you go to the top of the, um, the web page, as part of the uh, solutions, which are at the top here, uh, tar file containing all the solutions, um, then um, there's one there. So what I'll do is I'll go through that now. I'll actually go through an extension to it, which somebody actually mentioned last week. Last week, someone um, asked about how to send structures in MPI. So I thought, although I haven't given that lecture, it would be a good time to go through um, um, another example here, which does data around a ring, but sending structures rather than sending these single elements. And I thought that would at least point you, give you a pointer to how these are used in practice. So I'll monitor the chat here. Please ask questions uh, via audio if you want, but um, chat might be easier while we're going along. So I have just um, I've just downloaded the solutions, MPP solutions. They're very simple. I'll do the C ones for the sake of argument. Um, and then we'll look at each derived data types. Um, sorry, it's um, rotate. What I'll do. So I'll look at the solution and go through it in some detail. So, first of all, we include the usual header files. Oh, sorry, apologies. I should. Sorry, can people see that? Can someone? Is that a reasonable size font? It's it's hard for me to quite reasonably hard for me to tell if if that's legible, but. Fine, fine. I see a slightly current here. I've got more windows here, so everything gets squashed in a lot. So we do the usual stuff with C, include standard lib and standard IO, and there's our MPI. And then our main program, we need a rank, a size, and a tag, and some other variable, start, stop, I, and there's some other stuff here. MPI, com, com. But these are new things you haven't seen before. You've seen the status, but we have a request here. So as I said um, last time, one of the nice analogies, I think, for, for, for non-blocking communication is that um, it's like sending data via a courier. You go to the courier and say, could you please send this in the future? And why it's different from asynchronous communication is that you also get, if you're using, at least if you're using synchronous send, if you use a non-blocking form, like asynchronous, it happens in the background and you don't get a problem with deadlock. But because it's synchronous, you also get information on whether it's being received or not. And so like going to a courier, you, you get a, 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 a tracking number back. And in MPI, that's a request. And so in MPI, we have to um, we have to use a request. Copy because MPI com world. We're going to do everything. Oops, um, we're going to do everything in 
com world. Sorry. Okay. And um, we're just use tiny, well, we're not going to use tiny here. So we do the usual stuff npi net null null com npi com size. And then we want to find out where our neighbors are. So I said, although we repeat this process several times, at each stage in the process, our neighbors are the same. So I say left is rank minus one, left is down the way, and rank is right is rank plus one, right is up the way. However, I have to complete the loop to have rank plus one equals size, right equals zero. So if remember the, the highest number of rank is size minus one. So I'm sending to size, I should receive back again. And if rank equals zero, left equals size minus one. It's just a simple, you know, um, completing the loop. Um, so uh, you could of course um, you could, of course, use modular arithmetic here, but you have to be slightly careful and see, so we've been a bit explicit. Initial local value to, well, here we're using parts on equals rank plus one times rank plus one. I will actually use the alternative, which is a bit simpler, parts on equals rank, just to start on again. Um, and so, so there's a couple of things here. First of all, we have two variables here. One is the sum, which is what we're adding up, and the other one is what we're passing on, okay? Um, but we also have, so we're, initiate, we're initializing the path on equal to the rank. So the first time we send data out, we're passing on our own rank. In subsequent iterations, we'll just pass on what we receive, but here we pass on the rank. And so this i equals not i less than size i double plus, very important to recognize this is not a loop over processes. Some people think this is looping over the processes. This isn't, this is a counting loop. It's saying, We'll all do it once, we'll all do it twice, we'll all do it three times, we'll all do it four times. So, so, so P, the, the size has two meanings here. One is it's clearly the number of processes which are taking part in this MPI calculation, but it also happens to be the number of times we go around the ring here. Um, you could, of course, initialize your sum to be your rank, and then this would only be size minus one. But I mean, so what we're going to do is we're going to send the pass on value to our right neighbor. If I use synchronous send, it would deadlock, but I use a non I use um, non-blocking synchronous send. So I want to send my pass on value, which is one integer, to the right with a certain tag within the communicator, and MPI gives me back a request that says, "Yes, I will process that in the background." But here's the request that you have to remember. Having done that, and that's all going on fine, I can then turn around and receive from my downward neighbor MPI receive. And I'm going to call this add-on. I'm going to receive into the add-on value. I'm going to receive one integer from the person to the left with the same tag um, within the same communicator, and I get like a status here. And the status isn't relevant. Um, I, I can just ignore it here because everything. The status is you, off, you only normally consult the status when there's some ambiguity. You wildcarded because you don't know what the tag is. You wildcarded because you're doing MPI any source or possibly you received a message of arbitrary size. But we know here that we're receiving a particular somebody, we're just setting all the tags to one. And um, we know we're sending and receiving only one element. I then have to wait for that to complete, for the send to complete, and then I do, so now I have some that I've passed them on, I do some equals some plus add on, and I pass on equals add on, I basically prepare for the next, the next iteration. So, Every iteration I pass, pass on, but remember at subsequent iterations, I'm supposed to receive the add-on value and pass it on to my neighbor. So I have to swap them around. Now what, so I'll just check that this works and then come back um, and, and, um, um, and go through some of the subtleties here. So um, I have, I've logged onto the DAG, I've done the, the, now there was an issue last week, but that's been corrected. So if you follow the instructions on the, um, from week one, where you do some module swapping and some module unloading on the DAG, you will now get seamless operation on this horrible app. So I do MPICC minus O, uh, I think it's called rotate, rotate.c. I do MPI run, let's run on four, dot slash rotate. And so the sum is six on process of one, two, three, and zero. So that's what we'd expect. Zero plus one plus two plus three is six. So, so that all worked correctly. But just to really reiterate a few points, and hopefully not to completely um, bash, but, it, but it's really, really important you, you use um, non blocking communications. If I used, let's comment that out, and if I use synchronous here, 
and I would just have to take off the request. Okay, if I do that, that is guaranteed to deadlock because everyone is sending and no one is receiving. So this statement says, wait till the sender's finished before you go to the next line. But I can only go to the next line if there's a receive posted, so it's not going to work. So let's just check and, and run again. And as I said, an MPI, there are no timeouts. Um, what I could do, actually, this is maybe a useful thing to do. Um, I'll kill that. Let's run it in the background. If you're, if you're familiar with, um, with Unix, put now, because that means run some. So this is running in the background, but it has deadlocked. If I do top, which shows me what's running, you'll see some interesting things. Um, now, th this goes back a bit to the, to the MPI programming model. Um, you will see that I am running, uh, someone else is running a few things here, but you'll see that I am running four processes called rotate. So that, that makes it clear. When I do an MPI run on this N4, the operating system runs these four processes, which hopefully I, I get my cursor here. And my cursor seems to disappear. Uh, there it is, right. One, two, three, four. Okay. Now, it's very important to realize that the operating system knows nothing about parallel programming. The operating just thinks that the user Y4 TPSH with me has run four copies of the program called Rotate, which, which I have. The operating system doesn't know they're part of a parallel program. Okay? There might be five people running VI here and six people running Emacs. Who cares? The operating system doesn't know there are parallel programs. That's the first thing. They're also using up 100% CPU. That's because they're busy waiting. They're basically, um, they're all sitting in their synchronous end. And they're all going, please, you know, they're all actively phoning. Please, 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 please receive this message. And so you can see that they're all busy waiting, but it's never going to complete. So I better, I better control C this thing. And um, I'm getting very confused about which window I'm in because I can't cope with my cursor. Okay. So let's, let's, let's kill that now. Uh, oh, uh, I'm going to kill it. Equally, some people think that non-blocking communications are magic. They're not. If I was to do a non-blocking communication here, if I was to do this, if I put the weight here, okay, then this would also deadlock. I think I'm not, I can, I'll, I'll run it. MPI, I'll MPI run it. Not put it in the background, then it deadlocks. Because all you're saying now is, now it's basically saying, I want to issue this synchronous send in, an, uh, in a non-block and go on to issue this synchronous send in a non-blocking manner. And you're sitting there going, has it finished, has it finished, has it finished? And so you've nothing to The only reason that this, all the non-block communications do is they give you the opportunity to break the deadlock. And in here, the opportunity to break, break the deadlock is that I move the weight till here, okay? In fact, I want to ask a question, what is this weight? waiting on what is the wait when does the wait complete so i'm waiting on something what am i what am i waiting for here it's not really a trick that's not really a quick trick question but so i'm waiting on this request to to to, to be resolved in some sense what does that request so when i when the wait is completed what is guaranteed to have happened Wants to chip in with the chat message. Oh, that's a bit daunting. Well, so what, what I'm trying to get at is, um, I'm waiting for the um, for the the non-blocking synchronous send to complete. But I said that some people like to use, some people think or imagine you can use um, non-blocking communication to overlap communication and calculation. And in fact, you can try. Although it's a very simple example here, what you could do. Is you could put the weight here, okay? So here you're adding add on to sum. You know you've received add on here, okay? So you can do that. So you can say, I don't need to wait until I, I don't need to wait for the send to, to, to complete for me to do the local addition because that only requires the receive to complete. And because, because it's synchronous, the receive is synchronous, then by definition, I have the add-on value here. So I can delay the wait. And in, in a more complicated program, I might allow you to do real work here. Here, I'm just doing a simple addition. But I cannot put the weight. That is wrong. 
Can anyone, can anyone tell me why I can't put the weight at this point here? Why is that not a correct thing to do? Absolutely. So that's a very so so that's exactly the right thing. You might send the updated pass on. So that is not of so this at this point here. So all, when I issue a non-blocking communication, all I know is that somewhere between here and here it will complete. It might not have happened here. And so pass on equals add-on. If the system has decided to delay the, the send, I might add on, I might actually alter pass on. So this is related to the fact that between the initiation and completion of a non-blocking routine, you must not alter or touch the send buffers. Now, in this case, you kind of get away with it. I, I won't go into the details, but what, some people also don't have two variables, pass on and add on, they just have value. Some people say MPI ISN value, MPI receive value. That is incorrect, because exactly as Jacob has said here, uh, you could be altering the data before it's been sent. In fact, it's actually more it, it, it's actually more instructive to do it this way around. If I do MPI I receive, so I'm now going to do a slightly different version. I'm trying to do some live coding, which I'm convinced will go wrong. I want to receive the add-on value. I queue that up, okay, and I now have a a request here. I then do a synchronous send, and now the synchronous send works. Because the synchronous send, if I get the prototype right, will correct, because it will match my neighbor's non blocking thing. This is the naive thing to do here. People are questioning. So let's check, let's check that that's kind of, I can spell, which I can't. Let's check that that, that works. Actually, we've got the right answer there. But what some people do is they basically, you might say, well, I will, what I can't do here is I can't touch this, um, this add-on value until I have um, done the weight. And so if I do this, that is incorrect. Because what I'm saying is, uh, what I'm doing, let's just, um, you're doing two things that are wrong. Here. Let's, let's, let's sort of. What I'm doing is I'm just rearranging things, but I'm basically saying, you know, I'm receiving the add-on value, but I might be setting it to something else. And I can't do that because I don't know at this point whether the add-on value has been sent or not. So what happens here is not only do I get wrong answers, I get irreproducible answers. So I got a wrong answer the first time, I got a wrong answer the second time, but because but, remember the sums are supposed to be the same everywhere, but it, it depends, okay? Whether or not that statement um, here, pass on equals add on, overwrites the add on value which you're receiving depends on whether the receiver is completed that stage or not. And this is a timing issue. So it's, it's relatively unusual in MPI programs, but non blocking communications are, are, are difficult in MPI because it's one of the few places where a simple typo or a slight misunderstanding can give you not only wrong results, but you know you can, you can spot a wrong result, but irreproducible results. You get different results each time you run it. So you need to be very careful about that. Um, another thing I could do is I could just do what I, I could post both at once. I could do an MPI I receive, an MPI IS send, um, and I now have to do um, I've got two requests here. I'll have to have a request. Request one. And I will have to do two weights. And then this should work. This is so. This is this is the the more, the more general way of doing this. The breaking that the, the, you just say, look, I want to do a non-blocking receive a non-blocking send, and just you sort out of MPI. Now it would be more elegant for me to put these into a little array. Um, let's just check that that works. I get a cursor. That works. Uh, it might be more nice. Actually, probably it would be nicer to do this. 
have two requests. Get the first one, request zero, second one, request one, and I can do that. We have to wait on because this is not particularly good because this is saying I'll wait on I'll, if the way I had it written before, you were waiting on the receive first, then on the send. But maybe the send was completing first, so you're, you're, you're waiting around for the receive when you could have been dealing with the send. And that's why wait all is better. MPI wait all. Now have the request array. Um, I can't remember what prototype meant. Array of request array of count, okay. So I have to have. I also have to have two statuses, or status I, I don't know, plural of state. So I now have to do, so this is saying, wait on both these requests to complete, which is request zero and request one, the first one is the, but don't, you know, let MPI decide what order to, 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 um, to, to, to wait on them in. And I have to have an array of statuses, status zero will correspond to request zero, status one will correspond to request one. Um, I got the right answer. So um, hopefully that, I mean, so non-blocking communications are actually quite um, complicated because you do need, can be complicated because you need to be clear in your mind um, what's going on. And it's very important to note that you may be doing a send and a receive, but when you do the wait, you need to be clear, am I waiting on the send to complete or am I waiting on the receive to complete? That's important um, to know because that can that can affect the correctness of your program. Saying at what point am I allowed to, to, to alter or, or, or change the value of the variable? So did that? As I said, it's not completely trivial at all. And um, uh, does anyone have any questions about that? I don't. Hopefully, that is reasonably reasonably um, clear. I mean, this is where you do see the most. The most errors in, in MPI codes, either errors which are benign but still errors or, or, or actual errors. Um, so, if there aren't any questions, what I was going to do was, was go on to actually a topic um, which, in the full course, the exercise, next exercise, is to actually do this but not with. A single scaler, but to do it with a structure. Well, actually, apologies to the Fortran programs. I will just briefly um, do the Fortran one. Uh, I'll just get it works. MTI F90 minutes. I will rotate, rotate for F90. I'll run it. This is doing the other initialization of, of right time. Of rank plus one squared, so that the, the sum is different. And if I if I look at the code, um, it's just the same, except the um, the send status and the receive status. As this has been written to um, MPI and send, so we so it's just the same. MPI send pass on one integer right hand, I mean, it's the same syntax. The only thing I'd use this to illustrate is some people. Think you know can't be bothered specifying the status. You can do. If you don't want to specify a status. You could do MPI status ignore. I don't like doing that. I have to say, but, but some people. So if you don't, if you can't be bothered specifying the status variable, you can specify MPI status ignore. Let's just check that 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 compiles. Yeah. And so you now can't query the status, but in in a, in a deterministic program like this, that's not uh, not so much of an issue. So, as I said, because of a question somebody asked last week, the, the follow-on exercise to this is where we describe um, how you do derive data types in MPI. And so, I'll, I'll, I think the C version is is, is basically the the, the, um, the better one to do here. So, it's in uh, derive data types. So. What we've done here is we've now we've now got a compound object. So so why why do you have this concept of derived data types in MPI? So the lectures you you can find them if you look at the four courses which are linked in from from this this abbreviated course. But often in C programs 
um, and in four times rolling average now, you can define, uh, so I've got a compound structure here, which is integer followed by a double, okay? So I'd like to send that. I'd like to send, send one of these um, structure compounds. How do I do that? Well, there are two stages to an MPI. Um, first of all, you have to describe that structure to MPI, and that gives you a new data type. So we see there are some built-in data types like MPI into MPI, we on MPI, double precision and such like, but we can create our own data types. So what you have to do is you have to have a, um, a new data type called new type. What we're going to do, MPI data type new type says, I'm going to create a new type which I'm going to call um, you now, actually, I'd prefer to call it something like MPI compound, actually. That'd be more than I say. Because the um, you know, integer is MPI integer, real is MPI real, structure compound could maybe MPI compound. So there are two stages to it. First of all, I have to describe in, in, um, in gory detail to MPI how this structure is, um, is, is created. I'll have to replace these things here. Later, otherwise I'll forget. So the two things you have to tell MPI are kind of obvious. You have to tell it that um, there are um, laid out very well for this um, so the two obvious things you have to tell to MPI is this compound structure consists of an integer followed by a double. So I, so I have to pass an MPI an array of types, and these these are these are this is all because MPI is not a compiler. If MPI were a compiler, it would have access to the source code, and if I told it to send a structure compound, it would say, oh, I know what a structure compound is. It's one integer followed by one double, end of story. MPI is not a compiler, it's a library, so you have to tell it in gory detail um, what, what this structure looks like. So the obvious thing you have to tell it is that it's an integer followed by a double, and you have to tell it it's one integer followed by one double. Okay, so that seems like fairly obvious. You have to pass it an array of types, saying, look, it's an integer followed by a double, that's this type array. And you have to pass it an array of lengths, saying how many of them are. This is one integer followed by one double, very simple. The problem is that um, the compiler has a lot of freedom as to how it creates this structure. And you don't know where these objects sit. And so, in fact, it's very, very likely Compiler probably puts four bytes You don't know, but the compiler probably said, look, I like double precision values to live on nice eight byte boundaries. This thing's four bytes. Let's stick in four bytes. So actually, this, this object is probably 16 bytes long, although it looks like it's only 12 bytes long. So you have to tell that to MPI, because MPI is a library, it doesn't know what the compiler is doing. So you'll have to give it the addresses of these objects. You have to tell it where this thing starts in memory, which is zero bytes in, and where this thing starts in memory, which is eight bytes in. Well, I think it's probably going to be eight bytes. Now, um, there is a routine in MPI called an MPI get address, which does that for you. So um, you have to pass it an array of displacements, which tells MPI where these things sit, um, in, in respect to the start of the structure. So you could just use the address of object, but um, operator, but there's some various typing issues. So the, the sort of kosher way to do it in MPI is to say, I'm going to create one of these objects called parcel. Now, that, so com the C compiler doesn't guarantee what this object looks like. It can put padding in almost anywhere it wants, but it does guarantee that if you create two of them, they look the same. So let's create one called pass on. And I need to say, okay, I'm going to get the address of the first integer uh, element of pass on, and I'll store that in the first element of this disk array. And I want to get the address of the second element, and um, I'll put that on the second disk array. Now, these are absolute addresses. This is telling you where's the address of the iVal component of this pass on object and the dval uh, component of this pass on object. I really want relative addresses. I want to say how far are these from the start. So I have to tell MPI, okay, the displacement is disk of zero minus base, which is by definition zero. 
and this would run is this would run my space. So I give MPI the displacement, and it's probably best if I could print these out. Displacement. This is R percent B and percent D. This if I um, CC. Actually, so I'll, I'll I'll show you the rest of it. So the, that's the unfortunate bit. Hopefully, this is obvious. You have to tell MPI my compound structure is an integer followed by a double. But these displacements are somewhat unfortunate. You have to do this. Is one of the few places where you have to start talking about bytes in MPI. So you have to create one of these objects. So let's, let's just hide out a pass on one, do a bit of a dress operation, and, and take some subtractions. I'm going to print out what they are just so that we know what they are. Then you have to tell MPI, I want to create a structure. So MPI has different type creation routines. Because it's a structure in the C language, there's a thing called MPI type creates, MPI creates struct. So to create a structure um, which has two elements, I'm telling, I'm passing you the length of the disk arrays and the type arrays, and each of these has two entries. And I, you are now going to give me back a new type called MPI compound. So this MPI compound, if you look at the top, I just, just I, I declared the theme of type, MPI data type, MPI compound. So once I've created this object, this now has the same status as so, so the only difference about MPI integer, MPI real, MPI double is they're predefined. You can create your own MPI type, and I call this MPI compound. The technicality you have to commit it, you have to stamp it as being uh, eligible for send receive operations, some sort of technicality. Having done all that jiggery pokery. In the send receive stuff, we can now I can initialize the up, the integer component of the pass on of this compound object to be ranked, and the double position wants to be ranked plus one square. I've changed this to be not new type, but I wanted to call it MCAM compound. I think it's a bit more, a bit more um, explicit. So if I this should now work, but if you look, this send operation now looks quite nice. I'll, I'll put some spaces in here. But we're doing send one MPI compound, receive one MPI compound. This code here is identical to this, the, the, the code we have with integers. We previously had send one integer and then receive one integer. Now we're sending one MPI compound, and hopefully, if I have to find it correctly, MPI will send the structure correctly. So let's see if we can MPI CC. Minus O, um, what was it called? Jagati. Jagati dot C. MPI one minus N four dot Jagati. And you'll see that the um, the displacements are as I expected, naught and eight. So you know, although an integer is only four bytes long, it put in some padding. And then you'll see the sums are six and thirty, which is correct. We were, we were the initial the integer value was set to the rank, the, the double position value was set to the rank plus one squared. Um, I did it the other way around. The compiler probably doesn't put any padding. Okay, so if I do it like that, um, this code is going to this is going to break now because I've not done it, but at least in terms of displacement. Um, a naught and minus a. Oh no, okay, so I'm going to have to basically um, um, now the double part. Oh, I should really get this. I have to switch it around. So I've now switched this round so that there's a double followed by an integer, and um, this is a, probably a bit more. Um, Double. We'll see the space under one eight. So, so basically, it. So, it does. I mean, I could. Uh, so, so that's that's because you don't. Um, there, it didn't put any padding because it didn't need to. So, did that? Um, did that? Did anyone have any questions about that? You maybe have to go and look at the lectures, but that to, to get the. the to get the concept, what you have to do is, if you want to send a structure or any more complicated type, which isn't a, a basic type, you have to do two things. Well, you have to first of all tell MPI um, what it looks like, so you have to describe it, 
And then you have to basically call a data type creation routine, and this type, in this case, we call the MPI uh, type create struct. Was an MPI create struct um, to create it. And once you've done that, and you, and you also commit it, it then, once you've done all that setup, you can then use that object, which I call the MPI compound here, in send and send and receive operations. So you can send one MPI compound, which sends the whole the whole structure. And it looks more neat in your code. You're sending one compound, receiving one compound, and things like that. So, are there any questions about that? I thought it was a reasonable place to put that in because somebody did ask last week about how you send and receive structures. So, um, if there aren't any questions, I will now um, give the um, the uh, final le the lecture, which you should be able to get from the um, from the website. So if I now share that, um, I hope you should all be able to see that. So I'm going to talk about collective communication. Collective communication is very, very important. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend reading the MPI manual. However. Because collective communications are very, very important. If you want to write efficient, scalable programs, collective communications are your friend because they're they'll be they're implemented to be efficient. And so it's worth that's one let that's one section of the MPI manual that's worth looking through. Probably, um, you know, see which collective communications are available. A number of times I've seen people programming things up, very complicated communications patterns, and actually there was a collective communication which had done it before. I'm going to go through a few here, but there are around more than I'm going to go through here. So the point-to-point -point communications we've talked about before involve pairs of processes. Collective communications um, involve a group of processes. And the group is all processes in a communicator. Now, in simple examples we're going to do here, we'll use MPI Com World, and so everybody will be taking part. But in general, um, they, they operate on a, on, a on, on a communicator, which could be a, a subset of the processes. Examples of barrier synchronization, um, which I'll talk about. Um, broadcast, scatter, and gather are probably more interesting. Global sum, double maximum, etc., are really the ones which are, which are key. So the characters of collective communication, it's collective action over a communicator. All processes must com communicate. All processes must call the collective communication. And um, that is um, I'll come back to that when I, when I, when I cover the broadcast, that it, some people um, get this wrong and write incorrect programs, but it is important. If you're calling collective communication, all processes taking part, i.e. all processes which are a member of the communicator which is being used, have to call the communication. Synchronization may or may not occur. This is something of a technicality, but in my mind, the way I envisage collective communication is that they initially do a barrier, so everyone waits till they're called. They then do their work, and they call a barrier when everyone's finished, and they progress. Now, those barriers may not exist for efficiency reasons, but the, it, I think it's that the safest and, and, and easiest conceptual model is, is to imagine that there is synchronization. The standard collective operations are blocking, in the sense that you know they call them, and then when they're finished, um, the result is available. There did not used to be, well, in the original incantation of MPI, there weren't non-blocking operations. Um, non-blocking versions have been introduced, I say recently, but probably that's um, probably at least five years ago and into MPI 3. Um, so what you can do is you can start a collective communication and say, look, can you please take care of this and I'll come back later and, and see if it's, um, if it's completed or not. And they may be useful in some situations. I am yet to be convinced that um, it sounds like a really good idea. I'll come back to this, but actually, in my opinion, they're not really um, as useful as you might think. However, the extension is obvious. 
um, and you issue the operation, I'm not going to cover the non-blocking forms here, but if you call the non-blocking form, you stick an I in front of it, so instead of barrier, it's I barrier, and you get back a, a request which you can later wait on. So, so the extension to, uh, from the prototype, you know, from a user point of view, the extension from, from blocking collectors to non-blocking is fairly trivial. You stick a request parameter on and you wait on it, um, but I'll maybe come back to whether or not they're useful. There aren't any tags. Um, and receive buffers must be exactly the right size. So, um, so basically, the MPI collectors don't do very much checking. So we'll see that you have to specify um, lots of re receive buffers. Um, so in send point to point send receive, the MPI will check that the receive buffer is the right size. If an incoming message is larger than the receive buffer, it will complain. In collective communications, which might be being called by a thousand processes, for example, or hundreds of thousands of processes, uh, it doesn't do that check. It just says, look, I'll assume you've done everything correctly. Why do you think MPI doesn't do the check? Anyone think of a reason? I mean, it could. 100,000 processes called a collective routine, it could go and check that all the received bus for the, uh, buffers are the correct size, but it doesn't. Can anyone think why that might, might be the case? Because I said earlier on, um, the, um, one of the main reasons for having collective communications, it, it makes it make programming easier, but they're also there for efficiency. So the reason the MPI doesn't check is because it takes time. In the send receive operation, you've got one message coming in, you can check, you know, I've reserved 10 integers, how big is the incoming message? Oh, it's five, that's good, it's 15, it's too big. If you've got 100,000 processes all calling a, a collective communication, then I think it's a lot of time to check that all the arguments are correct. It would just take so much time, it's just not worth it. So collective communication is sacrifice some sense ease of use, robustness for, for, for speed. Basically, you know, you call a collective operation, you're calling it because you want the operation to be done efficiently, and you can't spend lots of time checking things like you've got all received buffers correct. So in practice, it's not really an issue, but it's just that's just the, the, the reason why it's there. So barrier synchronization um, is a collective operation. MPI barrier, I've actually you've seen it already if you've read the exercise notes I, I mentioned barrier using barrier when you want to do accurate timings of code, for time barrier. All the, um, all the processes in communicate to com, which we can think of as being MPI com, well, synchronize before they move on again. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's something of a subtlety, but in MPI programs, barriers are almost, almost never, I mean, never say never, but barriers are almost never needed for correctness. And so, I mean, if you want to speed up someone's MPI program, First thing to do is get rid of all the barriers. It is really, really unusual for an MPI program to require barriers for correctness. That is not obvious, okay? You often see a lot of people putting in barriers saying, you know, wait for everything to complete here before we move on. You do almost never need them. And if you do need them, if you do need them for correctness, there's almost always a more elegant and efficient way of ensuring correctness than putting a barrier in. So, you know, people tend to put barriers into MPI codes because it gives them a warm, fuzzy feeling that all the processes have reached this point or they're all, other than timing where you want everyone to start at the start line at the same time, barriers are almost, um, almost never needed for correctness. And um, sometimes people put barriers in their code and then inc incorrect code becomes a correct code. That's, sorry, a code which runs incorrectly, runs correctly. That's normally because they've made a mistake somewhere and they're just kind of being lucky. So my, I have, almost never seen an MPI program where barriers were needed for correctness. I normally just take them out across my fingers. We can discuss, it's not obvious at all, but um, broadcast is more useful. So the classic thing you do at the start of a program is you nominate um, a master, a controller process, rank zero, reads in some data from a file, and you want everyone to know the temperature is going to be 3.7 degrees and we're going to run for 100 iterations. So you broadcast. So MPI broadcast takes a buffer, which is of so many data types, and it broadcasts it. Root says who, who owns the... So on entry to broadcast, the data is 
valid on the route, which is often rank zero, but not always. And after the broadcast, the data has been copied everywhere. And maybe a I don't think I have a diagram for this, but um, uh, but I do for scatter. Um, so so broadcast, you might broadcast a single integer or five integers that you've read at the start of an array, a start of a program, and they're just copied everywhere. Scatter is a bit like broadcast, except the data is distributed. So if I if I so we're going at the start, the root process, which here is rank zero, rank one out of naught, one, two, three, uh, four, five, um, rank zero to four, there are five of them. Uh, rank one has A, B, C, D, E. If I call the broadcast and specify count equals five, afterwards everyone would have an entire copy of the whole array A, B, C, D, E, 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 A, B, C, D, E. So a, a broadcast would have taken this array and give an entire copy to every process. Sometimes that's what you want to do. But often you don't want to do that, you want to give each person a subsection. So here I've got an array A, B, C, D, E. I want to give A to rank zero, B to rank one, C to rank two, D to rank three, and E to rank four. And that's what a scatter does. It just takes the data in rank order and splits it up. And so after the scatter, um, the data is split up so that it gives A, B, C, D, E across the processes. And this often happens when you're reading the large data set and you want to split it up, you can use scatter to basically chunk it up and give different sections to different processes. And so let's look at the prototype for scatter, MPI scatter. You have a send buffer, a send count, and a send type, which might be the send buffer, might be your array, and then you're saying how many you're sending, and these might be MPI integer, for example. You have a receive buffer, a receive count, and a receive type. So in the diagram, this is the sender. So send buffer, send count, and send type are relevant to, to this array. And this is the, the receiver array. So you'll see that here the sending array is long and the receiving array is small. So you're doing a send buffer, send count, send type, receive buffer, receive count, receive type. For this previous example to work, where the send buffer is five long and the receive buffer is one long, what do people think the send count and the receive tank should be? It's not obvious, it's almost a trick question, it's not obvious at all. So if someone guesses, please don't worry if you get wrong, because this really is not obvious. So I want to send, in the previous example, I had an array of length five, and I was scattering it so that everybody got one, okay? What do people think the send count is, and what do people think the receive count is? Assuming it's just integers, so we have MPI data type is MPI integer. What do people think the send count, lead count is? So I want to take a guess. I should have a quiz set up for this if it's anonymous, but maybe you can just type. The same. Okay, they're the same. That's good, but what the same as what? So you've started off with an array of size five, and you've got you're ending up with five arrays of size one. What should they be? So we've got a couple of numbers, we've got fives and ones flying around here. What do you think they should, they should be? Five, okay, perfectly sensible answer. Um, so some people think that send count, sorry, send, the thing that people normally say is that send count is five and receive count is five, that's not true. In fact, they should be the same, so it ends right, but in fact, send count is one and receive count is one. So the way, so it's really, it's not obvious at all, but the way scatter works is you're specifying the size of the individual messages. So, so when you're saying uh, send count equals one, and receive count is one, you're, what you're saying is I'm sending one data item to each thing. If I send send count equals two and receive count equals two, then A, B would have gone to rank zero, B, C would have, uh, C, D would have gone to rank one and so on. So Ed's made a perfectly reasonable guess there, but actually it's not, it's actually the, the send count and the receive count relate to the size of the individual message not the global array. You might then spot that this prototype doesn't actually specify how big the global array is. Well, it just assumes the global array is big enough. So if send count and receive count is one, it's up to you to make sure that you have five edges. So yes, it's a function of size. So implicitly, MPI will say, right, he wants to send, uh, my cursor's gone, 
Uh, one, one to rank zero, this one to rank one, and it will keep going until it gets to the end. So it's up to you to make sure that your array, it, that your array is of size size. Or if said count was two, your array would have to be of size two times, oh, sorry, of dimension two times size, okay? Now, if you've got your thinking cap on, you might say, wait a minute. So send count and receive count are normally the same, and send type and receive type are the same. Why do you specify them both? Well, in almost all normal cases of operation in scatter, send count is equal to receive count, and send type is equal to receive type. However, you can do complicated things with derived data types, which mean that they might not be the same. But if you're only using basic data types, then, then send count and receive count are the same, and they're the small number. So that's something which people often get wrong. So is that clear? And as Victor said here, exactly, it's a function of size. It's up to you to make sure that the, the, the as MPI starts reading these messages off, that it doesn't run off the end of the array because you have made sure the array is big enough. In practice, it's not a big deal, but, but it is maybe slightly confusing. Gather is the inverse of scatter, and you might do this at the end of a simulation. Um, you start off with distributed data, A, B, C, D, E. So maybe each of the ranks has computed some fat some, some, some data, but you want to write them out to, to disk. So you might want to gather them all together on a boss process, which here has been rank one, but could often be rank zero. And we want to create the array A, B, C, D, E on rank one. So what I do here is MPI gather. The input data here, the send buffer, is the small array, and the receive buffer is the large array. And, um, and um, yeah, so that's how it works. So NPI gather, send buff, send count, send type. This is the small array, receive buff, receive count, receive type. This is the bigger, this is the, the big array. Um, the receive buff is the big array. But again, the count is one. The count is the size of each individual message. Um, so it's the inverse of scatter, but again, um, 10 months. Or as a number of processes. I oh, know, so the send count, so, so um, the send count here is one. And so basically, um, so I see what you're asking there, Ed, but the prototype is MPI gather, if you do MPI gather with send count, receive count equal to one, it says, I want to send one element to each process, as well, sorry, the gather. I want to receive one element from each process. And so you will get an A, a B, a C, a D, and an E. And uh, it, will just, it will just assume that you've declared this, the receiving array to be big enough. So scatter is the same thing. Scatter, you specify the same, the size of the, of the small message. So in scatter, you specify here, um, send count equals one, would say it would send one to, to rank zero, one to rank one, run, it's just up to you to make sure that this is big enough. Does that make sense? So again, the, the count is always the size of the small, um, of the small message. And it just keeps going. Ed does make a very good point there that in general, if I have an array and I want to decompose it across processes and it doesn't fit, what do I do? So I have a tutorial problem for the MSC students. I run this course as part of the MSC, which says if I have an array of size 18, I want to split it across four processes. How do I split it up? 4442. Um, I'm going to get this wrong. 4442. Uh, no, that's wrong. Um, it's five five. Sorry, but a rare size eighteen across. Do I split it five 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 three? Okay, or I could do five five four four, or I could do I could do four 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 six. How do I split an array out? And MPI doesn't say anything about that. MPI is just about point to point messaging. MPI doesn't tell you how to decompose. There, there are reasons why you might pick a particular uh, decomposition. But that's really your choice. MPI doesn't impose that on you. So, but the question that Ed is that what happens to the number of processes are not divisible by the count is actually a very important one. If you have a problem which doesn't evenly decompose across the processes you're using, you have to make your own decision as to how to do that decomposition. Somebody's going to have to have fewer or greater numbers of elements than other people, and there are pros and cons to different choices. So we've done scatter and gather, but in fact, by far the most commonly used reduction operations, uh, so by, by far the most useful and commonly used collective operations are the global reductions. Two different send counts. Ah, okay, so um, 
there is so that's a very good point so um yeah so exactly so, so I'll, i will show so i don't i don't it's a good oh no i'm trying to be too clever sorry my brain can't cope with the fact that i see two cursors i see the real cursor and i see the one i will now share um this guy so you should now see, so if I do man MPI scatter, you will see the first type of scatter, which we talked about, send buff, send count, send type. Yes, so, but there's a different routine called scatter B. So scatter B is like scatter, but you specify send buff, but you specify an array of send counts. So you basically you specify you say look I want to send this much to the first guy this much to the second person this much to the third person and you also have to specify uh, displacements which says not only what do I want to send where it sends it so MPI scatter V is pretty general it allows you to pick um, subsections of arrays placed in different um, places and there's the equivalent gather V so if people are doing um, Many real programs don't use gather and scatter because it's too restrictive. If you look at real programs in practice, they often use gather v and scatter v because in a real program, um, it's not that um, not that simple. But get gather v, scatter v are, are what you would use there. Okay. So I. Uh, So, um, so a reduction operation, a global reduction operation, is used to compute a horizontal volume data distributed over a group of processes, and that's exactly what we did with the reduction, the all with our message round array. We all started off with our own data, let's say our rank, and we ended up with the sum of all the ranks, which was um, the same value on every process. So, a reduction operation c c computes computes a unique result from a set of input data. You can do any, um, any. I'm going to get this wrong. Um, I'm not commutative, but the other one, um, not transitive, associative. Sorry, any associative operation is a valid deduction operation. So global sum or product, global max or min, global user defined operation. So sum or product. To be honest, global sum is the one you use all the time. So if you look through MPI codes. They will often do global reduction operations of a single integer or a single but double precision floating point number. You could you can do a product, but to be honest, if you multiply a hundred floating point numbers together, you'll either get infinity or zero, probably. So you can do much more minimum, which could be useful. So so if I wanted to compute the average age of everybody on this in this seminar, I would get you all to send me your ages, and I would divide by the number, of, I'd add them up and divide by the number of people. I might also want to know who the oldest person in the seminar is, probably me, um, where I would, or I would might, might want to know who the youngest person was. So a maximum or minimum can be useful. Um, this can be useful sometimes if you've got a termination condition which requires on, you know, the error value being less than some tolerance everywhere. Everyone said, well, my, you know, my maximum error value is 10 to minus 5, mine is 10 to minus 6. You can just do a global check and check, well, you know, if everybody, you can get the maximum of the maximum or the minimum of the minimum. Or you can do use defined operations. I'll skim over that a bit here. But what I was going to do after the break is um, was actually just like I kind of shoehorned in user defined MPI uh, derived data types, so user defined data types, when I went through the solution. When I go through the solution of this or all, all reduce example, which is one of the next exercise. Um, I will actually introduce you to the defined operations because it's, it's much easier to see it in a um, in a, a specific context than it is to describe it in general. So there are MPI has a lot of predefined reduction operations. So just like there is one send there is one send routine regardless of data type, one received routine regardless of data type. What you do is you pass an array or a variable to MPI. It's one send routine, but you tell it what, 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 the, um, what the type is through the MPI type. There's one reduction operation, but you tell it what, what to do. So there's one routine which does the reduction,
but you tell it what to do with the numbers. So if you want to do a maximum, you specify the operation as being MPI max, MPI min, MPI sum, MPI product. You can do logical and bitwise ands, logical and bitwise ors, if you're logical exclusive or and bitwise exclusive or. To be honest, MPI, ma uh, MPI sum is probably most commonly used. You might also ask, you know, um, you might be doing a, if you're doing a weather forecast, you might want to know, you know, what was the maximum rainfall in the UK? And you could do an abduction operation with operation MPI max. The maximum might be seven centimeters somewhere. But you might want to know, well, where was it? <laughs> you know, which rank had the maximum? So, so you, knowing what the maximum is often not just enough. You want to know not what the maximum is, but who had the maximum. And that's called MPI max lock and min lock. They give you the maximum value and also tell you which rank had it. It's just a slight extension. But in all the examples, we tend to concentrate on MPM sum because that is by far the most commonly used uh, reduction operation. So MPI reduce takes an input out, input data set, which is the send buffer, output data, which is the result, the receive buffer, a count, how many objects you're reducing, I'll come back to that, the data type, the operation, which is what you want to do, and the root is where the result is placed. So on input, everybody has their own data. On output, the result will be defined on the root. Now, we'll come back to what happens if you want more, want everyone to know the result. But the first root operation MPI reduce places the, the result on a particular process, the root. And it all takes place with the communicator, which, again, we'll just take as MPI com world, which is everybody. But, um, but um, um, I won't. Uh, uh, um, I won't, I won't use the generality communicators here, but, but in general, you can pass a communicator. In four types, just the same. Send buff, receive buff, count, data type, op, root, com, but there's an error value. So it's maybe easiest to see with an example or just a diagram. So I'm going to have to make my screen a bit bigger to be able to see what I'm, uh, what I'm doing here. Okay, that's better. So, um, so, MPI reduce takes um, data. Now, this is actually, there are, there are two concepts here. One is how much data you're reducing, and the other is how many processes you're reducing over. So what I'm considering here is a generic operation circle. Now, it's a general um, associative operation. You can just think of that in summation. I think of the circle operator here being addition, okay? What MPI reduce does is if count is equal to four, what it means is that each process has on input an array of size four. Okay. Um, this is not particularly the best slide because there are also four processes here. But the fact that the reduction, what it does is it takes the it takes each each array, little array of size four, and it adds up all the first elements, A plus E plus I plus M. Then it adds up all the second elements, B plus F plus J plus N then C plus G plus K plus O, then D plus H plus L plus P. Some people think that count is the number of, of processes which are doing the reduction. That isn't true. The number of processes doing the reduction is all the processes in, in the communicator, which could be an arbitrary number. Count equals four says that I have four numbers, each of which I want individually reduced. Okay? I want each across them, I want them to be reduced. And so if I specified root equals one, the output would be placed on root. So that would be A plus E plus I plus M, that would be B plus F plus J plus M, and so on. So the, the reduction takes place across, individually across each element of the array. Now in many, in many situations, count is one. We're just reducing a single integer. Okay, um, seems okay from my end. Um, can someone comment, is there a, okay. Okay. So MPI reduce, so is MPI reduce only for element by element operator? Yes, but what would what would your alternative be? So so you are correct, MPI reduce does element by element operations, but what would what would your other use case be? There might be an answer for that. It's a good question, but I didn't quite understand it in its entirety. Yes, that's exactly it. So 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 so, so there are two there are two misconceptions of what the count is. One is, and here the count is four. One is that that means the number of processes. No, the reduction takes place across all the processes that 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 um, that, um, 
that, that take that they're in the communicator. The other thing that people think is that well, they think if count equals four, then it will add up a plus b plus c plus d, and then do a reduction. If I wanted to know the sum of all these values, a plus b plus c plus e plus e plus e plus f plus g plus h, I would have to myself add them up locally, and then do a reduction with count equals one. So if you want to do a, a global sum of a huge array, it's up to you. To, there's two stages. One is compute your local sum, which you just have to do by bit of fact and addition. And the second stage is to sum the sums. And if it's an associative operation, you'll get the same answer there, modular rounding errors. So um, in fact, it is relatively rare to, it's relatively rare to do a reduction operation with a count which is different from one. In scientific and technical programming, um, it is relatively rare. Um, however, so functionally, an MPI reduction operation with count equals four gives the same answer as four MPI reduction operations with count equals one. However, it's much faster to do an MPI reduction, one MPI reduction operation with a count of four than four MPI reductions with a count of one. Can anyone think why that might be? And that's why MPI has this count. Um, you know, so if you have four numbers, if you want to compute the average age, income, um, you, know, um, you know, age, income, number of children, and number of houses, for example, it would be better to create a little array which had age, income, number of children, number of houses, and then do a, a reduction with count equals four, than it would be to reduce the age, reduce the income, reduce the uh, number of children, or reduce the number of houses. Okay? Does so anyone think why it's better to do one reduction operation with count equals four than four reduction operations with count equals one? Why is it faster on a, a large parallel machine? Well, wait time. Yeah, that, 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 so, so I think you've got the right answer there. The, the point is that what's going to be happening here is that basically MPI under the hood is going to be sending around lots of messages. And it's sending the messages which takes the time. Actually, adding together four inches or one integer, you know, it's four nanoseconds rather than one nanosecond. It doesn't make any difference. It, it's, it's, it's the coordination which takes all the time, okay? And so, for example, if I wanted to basically, you know, if I wanted to deliver... Um, if I was sending presents out to people, okay, and I wanted to send out um, to a thousand people, I wanted to send out uh, one, um, them, I wanted to send them out one bottle of wine and uh, one cake, okay, I would get the delivery company and say, right, please send these thousand people a bottle of wine, and then, oh, by the way, please send the same thousand people a cake. You would say, look, you would say what well, you say, look, here's a, here's a bottle of wine, here's a cake, send that to a thousand people. It's the coordination and the sending of all the messages which takes the time to, with, to a first approximation what the payload is, is it one integer or four integers so is irrelevant. So in reality, in practice, it will take probably four times as long. Each reduction will take the same time regardless of whether it's one or four elements. Obviously, if, if it's 4,000 or 4 billion, you're into a different ballpark. But for the typical case of small numbers, um, you know, it takes the same time to reduce one element to reduce four, so you want to do them all at the same time. Hopefully that was, and the, 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 the so yes, yeah, so so it, so absolutely, it's latency rather than the bandwidth. So it, uh, in MPI, um, there is, um, you know, to have sending every message, there's latency, which on something like Arctur will be in the region of, of uh, microseconds, there'd be a handful of microseconds, and then a bandwidth. And small messages are uh, small messages are dominated by latency. That, that's actually a circular a circular definition because what is a small message? A small message is one that is dominated by the latency. But a ballpark figure you know, on a machine like Archer, anything under a kilobyte is going to be latency dominated. You know? So you know messages which are a kilobyte or less are going to be dominated by the latency because the bandwidth is in the gigabytes per second. But the latency is in the in the in the um, in the microseconds, and so you know that's that you know so, so something under a, a kilobyte is probably latency dominated. So in fact, a lot of people think that their their programs are bandwidth dominated, but majority of programs, especially on large numbers of processes, are latency dominated. So so you're exactly right there. Doing a reduction operation is a latency dominated operation, and so you want to do it as few times as possible. And the other important thing is that MPI will, reduce, will, will, will implement these efficiently. And so um, your message around a ring 
will take for P processes, you're sending P messages, which is a bad thing to do, um, uh, a, a, a system implementation of, of reduction will be much more um, um, efficient. And typically, the time will grow as the logarithm of the number of processes. So a classic one is an integer global sum. You do this all the time. So we do NPR, I've got to get my cursor right, NPR reduce, I got X result, one integer. So, so I'm saying, I've got X, I want to add it up. So I specify the operation as NPI sum. I want the result to go to the result variable. It's one integer, and I want the, 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 the operation to take place across NPI called world. I want the answer to end up on rank zero. So the sum of all the X values is placed on result, the results is only placed there on processor zero. So this is, the, this is the analogy of our pi example, where we did it very inefficiently by sending all the data to a, a root process, but the answer was only available on a single root process, which we nominated arbitrarily as, as, as rank zero. So this is the kind that we see all the time. So that's a good point, a very, very good question. So the question was, I'm sorry, I've, I've minimized my, my, um, my window, but I will. So Keith asked, are reduced gamma scatter just own operators, are they just wrappers for a series of standard receives? So if you, down, if you download a generic MPI implementation of the web and run it, it is most likely that it is wrappers around a series of standard receives. However, it will be using a clever algorithm. So it will be using a clever algorithm. So to, so to reduce 1,024 numbers, rather than it requiring 1,024 sent and receives, as in the naive implementation of all sent to a master or send around a ring, it will do a tree or hypercube based algorithm. So it will take log 1,024, which is, which is 10. So it will be able to do it in 10 messages rather than 1,000. So even by just using a better algorithm, um, these reduction operations can be orders of magnitude faster than you, than you would naively program up yourself. So if you download an open source implementation like MPI CH or Open MPI and look at the code, you will see they have some algorithm. So that's a very good question. However, the reason why, so, so there are two reasons why collective operations are elevated to their own status in MPI. One is to allow the MPI library to have an efficient implementation, but the other is for, MPI, for the library not to use MPI at all. So for example, on, on machines like Archer, the network itself is capable of doing reduction operations. And so if you do the reduction operation through sent and received, what happens is you put the message on the network, it goes to the network, is then received on a, a different processor, which adds some numbers together, then pumps it back on the network or whatever. The, the, on, on, on sophisticated machines like Archer, the network is very clever. So the network itself can actually add numbers together. So when you call a reduction operation, you call some magic assembly language routine, who is a weird and wonderful crane routine, which you've never heard of. It can do the reduction operation where the data never goes back into the processes until it's finished because the network itself can not only communicate the data, it can add it up. And so on some networks, there may be a, a network specific hardware instruction, which, which does the reduction operation lightning fast and gets the right answer. And so by calling MPI reduce, you will, a, get, you will get a, a, an optimized algorithm on any platform, but without changing your code, you will get an optimized, you know, a Cray specific algorithm on a Cray an IBM specific algorithm on an IBM. And, even, and other things you can do if you know a modern, uh, a modern system is often, well, all modern systems are clusters of shared memory nodes. The implementation will know that all the processes on a node actually share memory. So it can do that local reduction in shared memory with no messages. So not only will the algorithm be log P, where P is the number of process, it will reduce to log number of nodes which is some constant factor down. So there's a whole catalog of reasons why calling reduction operates, so, sorry, by calling collective operations is a good thing to do. You get, you get good algorithms, you get efficient implementations on, a, on, a, on the target architect, architecture. So that's a good, are they just wrappers around send and receive? They may be, but they may not be. So that's a very good question. So you can do user-defined operations. Now, 
So what you have to do is very like um, when you do user-defined data types. So user-defined data type, you have to describe to MPI what it looks like, and the MPI gives you back a new type, which you can then later use and send and receive operations. If you want to do a collective operation which isn't described, which isn't in the base set of MPI, you can write a function which does it. So you have to write a particular function which has a pre prescribed prototype, and, it and it, I'll, I'll show you a specific, hope to show you a specific example after the break. But you have to define a function as a specific prototype. You then register that function with MPI. You say, look, in certain situations, I want you to use this function, not one of your own functions, my function. MPI then gives you back a new MPI operation of type MPI op, which you can then subsequently use. Now, it turns out that it's hard to think of a valid reduction operation, i.e. that is a valid associative operation, which isn't already in the MPI base set for basic data types. What you normally do, the, the, the times I've used it, is, um, is to, um, to find an, an MPI operation which is already defined like addition, but on a new data type. The only time I've done this myself is um, I wanted, well, it was that someone asked me how to do it. You have a thousand processes, and, the, and, the, and you want to, everyone has a list, and you want to find the top, the top 10 biggest numbers in this list, okay, a globe, globally. So each process can find its own top 10 numbers, but then you want to merge that top 10 across all processes to get a global top 10. So what you have to do, right, is a, a reduction operation, which is a merge. We take two arrays of numbers and comes out with an array which has the 10 biggest. Each of the input arrays are size 10, the output array is size 10, but the output array is the 10 biggest of the two lists. And I was able to do that by hijacking the reduction functionality and doing my own um, my own uh, reduction operation. But the MPI uses to find reduction operations, they're quite fun, I think they're fun, but um, they're better illustrated by a specific example, which I'll show you after the break. The reduction operation has to have this uh, the operator need not commute but must be associative um, and you have to register it and it's quite so you basically once you've written your function which is MPI user function you pass it to MPI and say look I want you to register this function I tell you whether it commutes or not because if it commutes then MPI has more freedom how to apply it if it doesn't commute it's more restrictive and it gives you back a new uh, reduction operation, which once you get it back, you can use subsequently. So the predefined ones are MPI, sum, max, min, you could do your own one here. As I said, that is really much more useful, uh, much more better, better explained through an example than through the, the code. The variance of MPI reduce or reduce is exactly the same as reduce, but there's no root process in the sense that the answer goes everywhere. So our pi example, where everyone said to a nominated um, a coordinator was a reduce, only one person knew the answer. Our message around the ring was an all reduce, everyone knew the answer. And actually, in scientific and technical codes, all reduce is often the, the most uh, useful, um, the most useful operation. Because often, if you want to take any decision on the result, if you just want to print it to the screen, you can do a reduce. If you want to say, if you're, if you're looking for some global error value, and you want to say, if global error is less than our tolerance, then I stop. Everyone needs to know the answer. So what you should do, the biggest mistake people make is they do a reduce than a broadcast. Well, that's functionally correct, but a single or reduce would be much quicker. Reduce scatter, the result is scattered. I've never used that. Re MPI scan is, is quite interesting. So I'll let MPI or reduce. So this is exactly the same diagram as the MPI reduce. With current equals four, you add up A plus D plus I plus M. but in MPI reduce, there was a nominated root, which I had a rank one. MPI or reduce, the answer goes everywhere. So MPI or reduce is actually by far the most commonly used function in scientific and technical programming, the most commonly used collective operation. MPI or reduce, it's exactly the same prototype as um, MPI reduce, but there is no root process because the answer goes everywhere. MPI scan is like MPI reduced, but it's a partial, um, like MPI all reduce, apologies. But so in MPI all reduce, on all processes, this would be A plus um, 
E plus I plus M. This would be B plus F plus J plus M. MPI scan is a parallel prefix. That says on the first process, I do A. On the second process, I do A plus E. On the third process, I do A plus B plus I. And on the fourth process, I do A plus E plus Y plus M. So it stops at a certain point. Okay? And um, you might ask, is that useful? Well, there are, there are various parallel algorithms that rely on these MPI scans. The only time I've used it is um, um, if you want to go from local to global numbering. So if you just think, you know, if rank zero has four objects, rank one has three objects, and rank two has two objects, okay? Four objects, three objects, two objects. You want to give them a globally unique number. So you want the objects on the first rank to be, to be numbered one, two, three, four, then yours to be four, five, six, and then the last ones to be seven, eight. If you're, if you're rank two, you've got two objects, you want to number them seven and eight. How do you know that your first one should be numbered seven? What you need to know is how many objects there are of all the people, all the ranks with rank less than you. So what you want is you want to know how many objects are there on all the people whose rank is less than my rank, and that gives it my starting position. So that's the only time I've ever used this operation in, in practice, is to convert a local number into a global numbering. If I'm near the end of the list, I need to know how many, how many objects are there on all the people whose rank is less than me. That's the only time I've used MPI scan. I, don't think, I haven't used it in practice in any other situation, but it does have its applicability. So it's exactly the pr same prototype as all reduce, but the, the operation is implicitly only done up to an included user. So uh, the exercise is to do the pass around a ring example using MPI reduction operations, but it's actually, excuse me, really quite a trivial example. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take the break at the advertised time. We're a week, five minutes, but I'm going to take the break from 3 to 3.30. By all means, have a go at this exercise, convert your round a ring example into an all reduce. But actually, it's really quite straightforward. So what I'm going to do after the break is, um, I'll share a different screen now. Well, first of all, I should ask, are there any other questions? We have some very interesting questions that you've gone along. Um, are there any questions that people might have? There is actually one thing I... In this example here, I have to have a separate um, input and output, so I have x and result. But often you do, often you say, look, I don't really care what the partial sum is. I want to replace it by the global sum. Um, in the sort of canonical incantation, this and this have to be separate values, not the same value. However, if you want to do an in-place reduction, just replace the input data with the output data. You can specify the first argument as being a special value. Someone's actually asked me this question this morning. And you specify it's MPI in place. So you would have, uh, whoops, there's a special value called MPI in place, which you specify as the first argument. That tells MPI, look, I want you to, to basically take the data and accumulate it in place in the second argument. That's something some people often ask. Um, so this is the exercise. What I will do is I will come back. The real interest about this exercise is to compare performance, to compare how fast your rendering example is how fast your Pi solution is with the inbuilt reduction, and you should find that the inbuilt reduction is orders of magnitude faster, especially on large numbers of processes. However, timing is a bit difficult to get, and you need to dedicate your machines, you won't have time to go into that. But I will go through the exercise, and I will mainly use it to, to illustrate how to do user-defined operations, just, just to, in case anyone's interested in that. So to go back to the timetable, what I will do is, excuse me, I keep using my cursor. I will we will reconvene at 3:30. But what I will do is rather than do the practical and give you give you time to do the practical, I will just go through the answer 
and then have a general Q&A at the end. So I suspect we'll finish slightly early, but I didn't want to leave people hanging around. It is such a simple example that it's, it's, um, it's maybe not worth. Um, in the class, it's worth spending time on because we can, we can talk about timing and such like, but on, on, it's quite difficult to get that to work without dedicated resources. So I will just cover the, the, I will just go through the solution here, then we'll have a general Q&A and probably finish likely about half past four, probably about half an hour early. That's okay. So if there are no other questions, I'll um, take a quick break and we'll be back together at half past three and I'll go through the collective solution and we'll have a general Q&A and I'm happy to answer any questions or go through any slides that people want to, 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 to ask about. So speak to you all again in, in half an hour's time. Okay, so I make that um, half past and come back from your coffee break. Um, I was just going to go through the um, so I thought it'd be easiest to just go through yeah, the example. So um, I'll go through the C1 first. Oops, I want to call on C. So um, it's just a very, very simple um, example. We've got the same base code as the rotate example where we have this, um, um, this pass on value, which we initialize, here we initialize it just rank plus one times rank plus one. And previously, if I send her this code, previously at this point, we did the message around a ring, which was a reasonable amount of code and had to be careful when using non-blocking to break the deadlock and be careful to, to, to avoid overwriting buffs and stuff. You know, what you, you know, what you often really do is do an all reduce. So the, what we're saying is we have this value locally is called pass on, we want to accumulate it into sum. It's one integer, and we want to do MPI sum. We want to add them up. And so it's really very simple uh, to do this. So I will just compile it uh, and run it on five. And you see, you get that down to 55, which I think is right. Um, I'm sure it's right. Um, so um, the things, the other thing to note, though, is that um, if we wanted to just do um, one, we would call it an MPI reduce, and this has the, the, alter, the additional value, which is the root, which here is set to zero. Let's set it to two for fun. That just says I want to do exactly the same operation, but the result is only known or, or, or defined on the, the root process here, which, which is rank two. So if I recompile. And we run, oops. we see that basically the sum is 50. The sum isn't defined, the sum is arbitrary, has to be zero on anyone other than the root processor than, 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 um, than, than rank two. Um, so uh, the other thing you could look at is that we could use a different value. We could uh, go back to the all reduce. I might want to do, instead of MPI sum, I could do MPI max. And that would do the maximum value, which we know what it is here, so we value on rank four. Let's compile again. Maximum value is 25, so that's the value on rank four. Four plus one is five times max 25. Or we could do a product as well. And what we could do is actually maybe if we do, um, let's do MPI, um, or reduce, let's, let, let's do the all reduce, but let's do MPI sum, but let's do MPI, uh, not all reduce, do MPI scan. But again, and we'll see here that, coincidentally, that the, the numbers have come out in, in rank order, but um, on rank zero, we get one. On rank one, we get one plus four. On rank two, we get one plus four plus five. On rank three, we get one plus four plus five plus 16. And on rank, rank four, we get the, the sum. So the answer on rank four is equal to the all reduced result. But you get these partial sums. I said that can, can, can be useful. This will say the other things that people, if you want to do, let's go back to the all reduced, which is the most obvious one. If you want to do it in place, what you're supposed to do. I want to do the sum, so if maybe you just want to do, um, I just want to do, say, sum, 
you know, to pass on. I want to just do an in place accumulating to sum. I'm not supposed to do this. Okay? I'm not supposed to do sum. I'm not supposed to have the input and the output the same. It may work, it may not. It's not okay. Let's see what happens. It worked there, but I have seen on other systems uh, it complaining, saying you can't do that. So we're just lucky there. But what you're what you, you are absolutely supposed to do is you're supposed to do MPI in, in place. Whoops. MPI in place. Which says that this this is an in place. So you don't specify send buffer. The send buffer is the same as the receive buffer. So that should compile. We should get the right answer here. But that's fine. There's one other thing I wanted to illustrate. Um, no, I can't think what it was. Uh, the other thing is, I'm going to show you the Fortran one, really the same. Um, I go to cold columns. Exactly the same. Um, or reduce parcels on one integer, MPI sum, comma, I hope it's the same, except you have error variable in the end. There, there is absolutely no difference between C and Fortran. It's done in capital T just to be. Charity, but there's no real reason for that um, um, to uh, to be done, except uh, yeah, that's it. So, so reduction operations are very, very, um, very sorry. Collective operations are very useful, and we most often use them um, for reductions, really, which are potentially the, the, the reason why they're important is broadcast, gather, scatter are the kind of things you might do a program startup and program. Finish. So you do them once, then you run your program for five hours, and then you finish. Um, so whether they're efficient or not, you probably don't care very much. However, reduction operations, global sums, tend to be right in the core. Right, you know, if you're iterating, do I equals one, do time step equals one to a million, right in the middle there, in the core of the loop, you often have reduction operations because you've computed values locally, and you want to accumulate them globally. And so they, although they may only take, you know, a few milliseconds. If you call something a million times, it's a few milliseconds, that's thousands of seconds. So, you know, they can often, reduction operations, especially uh, with MPI sum, are at the core of algorithms and you want them to be as efficient as possible. And so that's why you would call a reduction operation and not do it yourself um, for any number of reasons. Um, I think that was really all I had to, to say that was quite quick. But what I wanted to do, unless there are any questions there, I think, I think I've covered everything. Um, well, actually, I will. Um, I'll use the foreshine version to, to, to illustrate something. So we're calling the all reduce. So let's call that MPX 90 minus O um, for com 90. Runs. The thing which people often get wrong is they say, uh, well, actually, I'll just say um, if rank is not equal to zero. I'm sorry. That's very old fashioned. Um, An idiot here. So. I was just I, I've forgotten that my what do you think people are gonna have so that's so what I'm doing here is I'm saying everyone's calling all reduce except for rank zero. What do you think is going to happen there? And I'll have a guess. So, so all reduce, it'll break, yeah, but what will actually happen, I think, and I'm not going to, I think this will hang. I think this will just, I think this will deadlock. So it blocks, yes. So let's try this. MPI run. So 
So, um, we, yes. So, so, so rank zero didn't call the MPI reduce. So it gets to it gets to its print having not done the MPI reduce, and everyone else is just sitting there um, unstalled. Everyone else is waiting for rank zero, but rank zero has um, has um, has. has um, gone away and done something else. However, this illustrates an interesting point, I remember why I was doing this, is that What do you think people? What do you think? What do people think will happen there? Rank zero is not executing this line. It is executing this line. So there's sort of I can think there's sort of two possible answers here. It's not immediately obvious what. Um, what do people think happens there? They want to have someone to have a guess. It's not obvious, but yes. So, so, so what? So the important point is that all processes in a communicator have to call the. Um, so Keith has got exactly the right answer there. But Keith, rank zero will send a hundred, all others will send pass on, and some, some that's exactly correct. The reason is that all reduce or any collective operation requires that all ranks in the communicator call that routine. But they don't have to call it from the same line of code, okay? And in fact, the MPI library doesn't know where, where the, you know, the library doesn't know what routine it's called from. So just because they're being called from different lines of code doesn't mean these match because they're all being called from the, from the, in the same communicator. So collectives match if they're called in the same communicator. They're not matched on what line of code they're called from. And so it doesn't matter what line of code they call from. If you think about it, the library can't possibly know. So I should get some. I run this, I get 154 because instead of supplying one beforehand, which rank zero did, rank zero, did, so we got 55 rank zero supplies, and number which is 99, uh, 99 because we get 154. So that's quite an important point that you know it's it's not the 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 um. Um, the, the all reduces don't match on a line by line basis, uh, they match on, um, on, on a per communicator basis. As I said, it's impossible for MPI to actually know what line it's called from. So, sum is not overwritten in what, so let's have a look what, what have I done here. Uh, so, yes, so basically, um, the 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 the, the um, sum is overwritten. The sum value is um, computed from the sums of all the numbers it was supplied, and everyone except ah no. Well, remember that. So okay, so that's very so with that's a very good point. We're thinking in our mind sum is a global variable because it it um, because it um, it has the same value everyone. But remember when I run this on five processes. There are five values of sum. So in an all reduce, the sum, each, each, each process provides its own storage, its own storage for the result. So process zero says put it in my sum. Process one process put it in my sum. So in fact, um, I could do this. So maybe this makes it more obvious. I call that sum one. I need to have a new sum one sum here. We need to initial sum one here. But what this is saying here is that it's saying, remember, all these are being called individually by each process. They're all provide they're all providing their own sum value. Okay. So they're all saying, look, add this all up and give me an, the answer and place it locally in my so so this still works. It's just saying that the rank not equal to zero is saying place the answer in sum. And the ranks um, otherwise. If, if I initialize sum and sum one, uh, and I'm trying to do this live, so let's get that, that, that equals minus one. 
But that is a very good question. Uh, Victor's answer is a very good question there. Because in our minds, we're thinking of some as being a global variable because, because we know it's got the same value very well. But that, in fact, there are multiple versions of it. So let, let's actually just go back and done it too quickly. So what we're doing is we're initializing sum to minus one, sum one to minus one. This works because they're both called the same all reduced, but the answer is placed in different places. So let's see. Uh, but yes, on that's correct. So we get the right answer that on um, my gosh, so, that on all the ranks except for zero, sum is one five four and sum one is minus one. But on on rank zero, sum is minus one and sum one is one five four. So that's actually a very good question, Victor, because it, it's it's the way I've written it, which didn't make that obvious. So so. And the other thing I wanted to say about um, derived, I didn't mention about derived data types, is again, when you, um, when you, when you, when a process registers a data type with MPI, it's using the definition of the data type which is, lo which is local to it. So if you think about it, oh, I said very back on the, on, on the first day that MPI in principle can work between two different architectures. So what happens if you have an architecture where you run compiler one and it put padding in between our iVal and our dval and architecture two didn't put any padding well it's all okay because process one and architecture one um so if, if compiler one and architecture one puts in padding and compiler two and architecture two doesn't it still works because the local definitions of what the data type like are correct and that allows you to pass the structure between two architectures which have different representations of that structure um, that may take the thinking about. So if you use reduce, not all reduce, and two as root, is it overwritten? Um, I think. Reduce, I think. Um, I think I need to do it. Where does the root come from? I think I remember. I, don't, I use MPI reduce so infrequently. With all reduce, that's the all. So in this case, I think that um, I think that basically some, both some and some one will be untouched, other than on rank two, where there will be set to the right answer. Does that make sense? Is that what you wanted? Let's have a look. Oops. Uh, you know, basically, the only value that's where the only place where the output is set is on rank two, and it's set in sum. Does that make sense? Yeah, fine. So I just wanted to briefly go through, I said I'm slightly running ahead, but just to give you a feeling of how it works, um, how it works for the, um, the uh, I've written a version which does, um, sorry, I need to go to the C version, that's why I can't find it. So what I have here is I have my structure compound. So now I want to do the thing where I add up these compound values. Now I can't ask MPI to add up these compound values. MPI has never heard of structure compound. Okay, I've just invented it. How can MPI know about it? What I want to do, I'll skip past all the all the all the gunk. I want to do this. I want to MPI or reduce, pass on some one um, um, MPI. I think I've maybe not. Have I done? I was in the middle of. So, so actually, apologies. So this is something I've done just now. Um, so. so what I want to do is our MPI or reduce. Pass on some, and I want you to add up one, it's one MPI compound, I want to add them together, MPI sum compound. 
So here we have to do two things. We have to tell MPI what an MPI compound is. And we saw how to do that before. We also have to tell MPI how to add them together because um, otherwise it won't know what to do. So the first thing we have to do is to define the MPI compound, but this is exactly the same code as we had before. We do the get address, we specify the displacement for the types and the lengths for both one, and we do a create struct and we do a commit. So now we've told MPI, look, and there's this thing called MPI compound, and it's made up of an integer followed by a double with these displacements. So that's all okay. How do I tell it how to add them together? Okay, if I if I basically let's let's just let's just say let's try the naive thing. Let's try and just tell it to add them, okay? It knows what a compound is, why don't you just add them up? It says an error occurred. Uh, what's that? MPI will reduce the reduction, the reduction operation MPI sum is not defined for non-intrinsic data. What it's saying is, look, if you give me a double or a real or an integer, I've known what to do with it, but you've given me something called a compound. I've never heard of that. Okay. What am I supposed to, how can I add compounds together? So you have to tell it how to add them together. And what you do is you declare a function. So the first thing you have to do is declare a function. I call it sum compound at the bottom here. And it has to have this prototype. It has to take a um, it's all horrible pointer stuff because it takes a void pointer to an in input vector, an input output vector, a length, and a data type. So I have to coerce these pointers to be the things I want. So the, 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 these are the things I want to add together the input and the input. I, I, I do it in place. So you get an input vector and an input output vector, and the result is supposed to go to the input output vector. I have a bit of pointer mangling because I have to say, well, I want I want these things. You've given me a void pointer because you don't know. This is a generic routine for any type. I have to cast it to point to structure compound start in vec start in out vec. I just do a casting in vec and structure compound start v in vec. So the, I've called these v's because these are void pointers and I've cast them to actual. So this is now an array of compounds. And for some reason, it gives me a pointer to the length. I don't know why, but I don't know why. Anyway, and now I just do right plus not i less than i double plus. How do I add two compounds together? So I loop over all the elements. I'm actually only going to do count equals one, but I have the general routine. And I say in out vec i i val is in out vec i val plus in out vec i i val, and then I bet d val is in out vec d val plus vec d val. So it's clearly obvious how I add two compound vectors. I just add the components. But C doesn't know how to do that. MPI doesn't know. So this is this is what I'm now telling M is that the MPI. If I pass you something, an MPI compound object, I want you to do this to it and do this. So this code will now work. But I have to register it with MPI. So I have to so I've defined this pro it has to be of this prototype that is defined. Then I have to do MPI op create, which says MPI op with some kind of this says, see this routine I've written called some compound. I want you to register it as an MPI operation. And give me back a new MPI op, which is of type MPI sum compound. We go back to the start here. Um, I've declared MPI sum compound with type MPI op, which is the which it is the type of the predefined type MPI sum MPI max. But you don't normally care, but now you care. So I now create that, and now I can accumulate. This one means it. it this one is whether it uh, commutes or not, and this is commutative operation. So one says TV does commute. So this is saying, please register this um, routine which I have written called some compound. Um, I want you to, to register it as if it was an operation called MPI some compound. I can call it what I want. By the way, it commutes, and then I can do what I want. MPI or reduce if I do MPI some compound. Now, if I run this. I will get the right answer. I get six. So, so I initialize the integer values of the rank and the double precision values of the rank plus one squared. And so they add together correctly. Um, so, and in fact, you can do, this allows you to sort of, if you don't believe about what's called, I can do a print. see I get quite a few how these out. So so it is calling that routine. 
and I could do anything I like, up to me, I could do something stupid. Let's multiply them together. You know? Um, oops. I'm getting. So Keith asked, can this be done with members of C++ classes? I, so the problem with, I'm not really a C++ program. I mean, a C++ class, I mean, if the object, yeah, yes. I mean, the problem comes to you, you can't do anything with any, any member functions. They have to, you know, you could member variables, yes. I mean, it's the, I'm not really like, basically if your C looks like C, yes. If not, um, I don't know what I presume C has the same kind of rules for how it orders things in objects as as as, as M. Um, I maybe need a specific example to be able to answer that question better, Keith. That's a good. I mean, as I said, I'm not a C plus plus expert. I mean, the, the you know the, the not very helpful but true answer is that you know two C plus plus all the MPI functions are C functions. But you're right, we're doing a, something a bit more low level, a bit dirtier here. So um, what you could do in C plus plus, of course, is you could overload the operator. So you could just all this would look a lot nicer. You could just say. This would look nicer because you could have overloaded the plus operator on the on the compound object. So this plus now, unfortunately, although you've done it in the language, so it's still a slight shortcut. You so, so so you could it looks a bit nice. I don't, but I guess you're asking something different. I don't quite know what the members. I mean, that's not going to work if I try that here. It's going to say. Yeah, invalid operands and binary plus have structure components. Or structure, I don't know what to do. You can see plus plus because you could overload those. Um, in Fortran, you can do the same thing, but um, uh, the way that the function pointers work in Fortran is, is um, well, the equivalent function pointers is, is a bit more of a rock, so it's a bit harder to mangle, but it's doable. Um, it's just an old, for, very old fashioned Fortran. For the had function pointers, but they were slightly weird things. Um, and in modern Fortran, they're phenomenally verbose, so I can never quite get them to work, but that's just me being old fashioned. So, so as Keith, I'm sorry, I don't, I need maybe need, need a specific example to say yes or no to, or can have a specific example I can pass on to a colleague who's a better C programmer who could, uh, yeah, fine. So, I that was really, so as I said, we're, um, I mean, we're on to the sort of general. I really, you know, I wanted to leave. I always thought people don't mind finishing a bit early on the final day, but I really am happy to stay for as long as people have questions at all. I mean, this is your chance to ask about more general things. But please ask about things that I've covered in the course. But please ask about things, anything at all related to parallel programming or or MPI um, that that you want that you think would be an interesting question. Um, there have been a lot of interesting questions during the course, and I think. It's given me a good idea for some additional examples to put up um, to illustrate things. But I don't know if I have anyone, any, anyone, any questions at all. You'll have noticed that the the glitch we, I think I said I mentioned the glitch we had with the um, data analytics cluster has gone away, so we don't get these nasty error messages when we run NPI and that the system people are very good and fix that very rapidly. So Ben says you mentioned NPM place. I know it's been avoided. Yeah, uh, I think. I mean, all that would happen is if you. What might happen is if you specify NPI in place. What might happen is that the NPI library has to allocate a temporary buffer. So so you know the way to get around NPI in place is to do. Um, let, let's. Um, did I have? 
That's how I think about it. Which one was it? It was um, no. So the way to get RAND MPI in place, if you want to do uh, this, is just to do. And then sum equals ten, right? So, so that's you know, that's what you end. That so, so the NPA in place is just to stop you having to do this. Now, of course, if if sum is a big array, you're going to have to allocate a big array for temp and then do the copy. So, so if you're unlucky under the hood, NPI might be a bit conservative and say, well, to do it in place, I need to allocate an array, do the reduction from there to there, and then copy it back again. But I. I think it probably doesn't do that. Um, there are some weasel words. In, in fact, I was looking at this this morning. Um, for someone had a, and I, I looked up the standard. There's some sort of weasel words in the standard which make you think that. So I don't. I don't. I mean, for anything other than massive reductions where you're you know, you you you're, you're reducing tens of kilobytes, the overhead of doing a bit of allocation and stuff is nothing. So so no. I I for some reason I. MPI in place didn't exist in the very, I don't think MPI in place existed in the very, very first incantation of MPI way back in 95 or whatever. So that's why I slightly shy away from it. it but um, but it, it is really just a, a sort of a shorthand um, for, um, yeah, it is just a shorthand. So I don't think there's any good this one. Yes, it should work now. It should have worked. It should have worked. In fact, I was the MPI gather. So someone asked a question on the help desk about MPI gather v, and I was about and, and the error was they were calling MPI gather v with the same arguments. Uh, and I looked up the manual that said you can do MPI in place. The MPI gather v is one of the most general operations you can imagine. It's like scatter v. You know, not only it's a one to many. You have and even that you're allowed to do in place. So yes, you can use in place. Um, uh, but yes, it should. I mean, it may, it may, might involve some allocation, but I doubt it. I, I doubt there's any issue there. Um, so yeah, I, I just, it, I think, I think when it was first introduced, MPI in place had some restrictions, like it only worked on. I can't remember. So I think when it first came in, maybe it was a bit dodgy. But no, it's absolutely, it's fine now. I do tend to avoid it because I'm a bit old-fashioned, but there's no reason um, to avoid it. And in fact. The natural thing to do is in place because if you think about the pi example, the subsums are meaningless numbers. You know, the sum of the expansion of a pi from n equals 95 to 123 is a totally meaningless number. The only number that means anything is the sum. So th in this case, you know, the temporary is something you really, you really, sorry, the initial value here is probably meaningless. You know, it's it's some arbitrary uh, con con contributor to a global total. So. You know, you almost never want to so overwriting the, the, the data is often the natural thing to do. So if I'm using MPI and OpenMP together, yes. Yeah, so there is a there's a whole bunch of stuff to do with MPI and OpenMP together. Um, I let's think. If I could maybe give me half a second. Um, I'll see if I can find a slide on that. Um, excuse me, I'm just. Hmm. So, okay, I thought I, I, I don't immediately have it to hand. I'll try one more. Sorry about this. Um, but you can you can combine MPI and OpenMP, and there is stuff in the standard about about how to do that. And in fact. Um, MPI um, that when you initialize um, that's weird I don't have it here but when you initialize MPI now you can actually um, initialize it in different ways and you can tell MPI that you will be doing mixed MPI open MP programming and MPI can in principle um, can in principle um, optimize itself so or, or configure itself so it can cope with what you want. But um, the I'll try one more go here. Let's 
see if we can get that. So, okay. Should be able to get this slide up. So, yeah, right. So, I'll now try and share this uh, slide. So we now have, this is grabbing a lecture from a, another course, which is actually in the advanced NPI, in our advanced open key course. But, so, so, so the, the, the motivation is that a modern supercomputer looks like this, that you actually have uh, multi-core nodes. So you might have, for example, uh, Archer has 24, you might have four processors or four cores on a node, each with their own cache, attached to a single piece of memory attached to the interconnect. So at the end of the interconnect, the end of the, of the network, you don't have a single processor machine. There's no such thing as a single core machine anymore. You have multi-core machines. So it seems crazy that in the MPI model, this will be ranked 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 15. In the MPI model, if that process wants to communicate with that process, they would send a message to each other. But you actually know that they're, they're sharing memory, so why don't they just use OpenMP? So you can do that. But you have to really think about, you know, whether you want to do this. So, you know, development, maintenance, cost, portability, and performance, you know, for example, this is just saying, you know, development maintenance will be much harder for an MPI code and much harder for an MP code. So, you know, I, I, it's a lot, it's quite a lot to maintain. Um, portability, you have to worry about, you might be, you know, the main issue is, 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 is MPI thread safe or not? Um, I'll go through this quite quickly and I won't go through that. But um, I'm looking for a, the styles, okay. So MPI distinguishes between, sorry, I'm, I'm doing, making a mess of these, making a mess of this, this, this um, that's my own fault, sorry. I'm just, I'm just not able to, well, okay, there we go. So, MPI has, right, so this is the slide I want, four styles of, 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 of mixed mode programming. Master only, all MPI communications take place in the sequential part of the MP, of MP program. And that's the simplest way of doing it. So basically you have a process which does MPI calls, and then when it does an open MP region, which you can think of just being a way of doing a bit of calculation faster with multiple threads, there's never any MPI in that, in that, in, in, there's never any MPI in that, um, in that open MP region. So only one thread in this problem, in this case, the master thread that, that the parent process calls MPI. But all this is the same thing, really, all MPI communication takes place through the same master thread inside the parallel region. So the simplest model is to make sure that when you call MPI, there's only a, only one thread does it, the master thread. So the process or thread zero is the only thread that does MPI. And then the MPI library has to support nothing extra. Basically, it, it, it doesn't even know it's been called from an open MP program. Serialized is the same thing, is that you can say, well, I'll allow multiple threads to call open MP, but I'll make sure that only one thread is calling at once. So again, the MPI library doesn't have to do anything particularly clever because you, 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 you've dealt with any race conditions between threads higher up. Multiple is the, is the killer, where, you, where an open MP, any open MP thread can call MPI at any time. And that requires the MPI library to have a lot more functionality to cope with you know, multiple threads calling the same library. And that makes it typically a lot slower. So you, you actually, when you initialize MPI, I'll skip through the examples, but if you, you have a region called MPI near thread where you say what level of thread support you want. You do MPI init thread, and this replaces MPI init. So what you're saying is, I'm, it's a weird syntax, but what you're saying is I'm initializing MPI for a threaded environment, and you give it required and provided. You say what thread support you want, and it gives you back what it can provide, which might be less. And the thread support you can ask for is MPI thread single, MPI thread funnel, MPI thread serialized, or MPI thread multiple. And typically, if you've written a very general program where different 
any open MP thread can call MPI at any time. You'll require MPI thread multiples. So you'll need to initialize MPI. And then MPI will have to take a very conservative view, be very thread safe. And that typically adds a, I mean, they're getting better, but typically adds a huge overhead. So does that, is that, did you, is that kind of the, what you wanted to know? So I've lost my chat when you're not watching that. Was uh, Susan? Sorry, Susan. Uh, so actually, okay, you have a code which already open, uses OpenMP. So the normal, the normal development route would be to have an M writing an MPI code is much harder than writing OpenMP code. So what you would normally do is write the MPI code, run it, and then if you had a performance problem, you might introduce OpenMP to it. But if you have a working OpenMP code, that's not normally a you, a step on the route to writing an MPI code because the parallelization strategies are so different that you're going to have to go back to square run to write your MPI code. So you can add open MP to an MPI code, but you don't normally add MPI to an open MP code. I don't know if that makes sense. It's sort of the way it works. So if you want to run a program on more cores that are available on a shared memory node, then yes, you need to use MPI. Well, I, I think really you have to, so, so by, by, by doing the OpenMP parallelization, you have understood what the parallel, what the, the potential parallelism is, is in your program. So you've understood what can be parallelized. But to implement, but, but the point is you now need to write an MPI code first to get it to, so basically you need to go back and sort of start again, yes, write an MPI code, which will need a different parallelization strategy because different implementation because you don't have any shared data in MPI, so you, you can't, if you want the data to be distributed, you have to physically send it to different processes. It's a very different model. But then you could reintroduce OpenMP. I mean, my, in most cases, it's hard. If you have a working MPI code, you may get some speed up by adding OpenMP to it, but in, in my experience, it's fairly marginal. But your problem is that you will need to effectively go back to square one. However, you will have identified the parts of the program which can be parallelized through your OpenMP parallelization. So you won't have to do a lot of thinking, but you'll have to do a lot of implementation to get the MPI working. But they are there, it, it, it doesn't really make, maybe it's not obvious until you've done programming in both paradigms, but they are very, very different models um, from each other. And people say writing MPI code is. 10 times harder than an MP code. I mean, that's just a number out of the box. So, can you gain a performance boost from adding OpenMP to an MPI code? So, so Keith, so, so, so there's a, there are various reasons where you, you can, so let's go through the reasons here. So four possible performance reasons for mixed open MP MPI because one is replicated data, and that is what you are saying. Basically, if you have a large memory level, so, so, so look, I don't know. In the early days of GPUs, and thankfully this isn't the case anymore, but you know, people used to say my GPU program is is a hundred times more efficient than my CPU program, but they were comparing a GPU with hundreds of CUDA cores to a serial program on one, on one CPU course. It was unfair comparison. If you see a paper which says my program goes four times faster when I introduce OpenMP into my MPI code, the normal reason is that they have run out of memory. So basically they've got, say on Archer, they've got 24 cores on a node. They can only use six of them because above six they run out of memory. And so by adding OpenMP, they've got a lot faster, but there's no amazing algorithmic reason why it went fast is just they ran out of memory. So you can't, poorly scaling MPI code, you can sometimes, um, you can sometimes get around. So what I mean here is, for example, um, if you're familiar with FFTs, you might have a, a cubic data structure and you've decided you have an FFT based algorithm. So you've divided the cube up into slabs, okay? So if you're 100 by 100 by 100 cube, you give each process 100 by 100 slab. And that might be hardwired into your algorithm. You then realize later on that, you, that, that that, of course, limits you to 100 processes because your decomposition strategy is based on slabs. 
And if you're 100 by 100 by 100 cube, you only have 100 slabs. So you have two options here. One is rewrite your algorithm in MPI to not decompose in slabs, but decompose in 1D pencils. So you have 100 squared um, units of parallelism. Or you can take your existing code. This is a poorly scaling MPI code. Uh, well, actually, it's more, more, more actually, maybe three limited MPI process numbers, and introduce OpenMP. So now, instead of scaling to 100 processes, you can scale to 100 nodes, which on Archer is 2,500 processes, and then the parallelism within a node is eaten up with, open, with, 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 with OpenMP threads. Um, the fourth one used to be true. MPI implementations didn't used to take very good advantage of shared memory. So, but they do now. So, so messages between two processes on a node are very quick. If you do an all reduce, the MPI will know that all the processes on a node are on the same node and do all that in shared memory. Um, the big downside, which most people really forget, I try to illustrate with this diagram. Again, sorry, I'm, I'm just crossing this off right there. So, no, I don't think there's a very balanced argument because, um, because, sorry, I apologize, this is taking me a long way around. Uh, memory bandwidth is, is a hardware feature. And so, um, you know, if we think about, uh, you know, if you have 24 cores on Archer, 12 cores per CPU attached to a block of memory. I mean, in Linux, the difference between a process and a thread is infinitesimally small. Yeah. Process and thread are identical. Two threads can share the same memory address, two processes can't. End of story. They are just the same thing. So, you know, the fact that one can share memory and the other can't has a huge impact on how you can use them. But from the operating system level, you know, a thread and a process are just the same thing. So they're a program running on a core. So whether you've got 12 threads or reading data, or 12 processes. And in fact, although they're harder to write, MPI programs tend to run better on cache-based machines because the performance hit you take on a cache-based machine is when you accidentally read memory, which is in somebody else's cache. So one core accesses memory, which is cached in another core. But if you write a process-based program like MPI, it is impossible to access the top data in someone else's cache because all your your memory is written fence, so it's cache, 100% cache, cache friendly. Whereas an OpenMP program, if you get it wrong, can have severe performance problems because you get this cache thrashing and such like. So I don't think there's a memory balance argument. The um, the what this what this diagram is supposed to show is that an M, if you've got a six-core node. The MPI pro program is six processes, each running on each of the, the cores. I call them P per process here, but you really call them cores. MPI plus OpenMP means that in the parallel regions, you do a fork join model, and you have here one, two, three, four, five, six threads. That's great. The problem is, anywhere where you're running, where you're not running OpenMP, you're running on one of the six cores. And so, this is Amdahl's law writ large. Basically, you have to introduce OpenMP into every part of your program. Because any part of the program that doesn't have OpenMP in, you're only running one, in extreme case, one process per node. So people think the MPI plus OpenMP model is six MPI processes become six MPI threads. No, it's not. There's one MPI process. So the problem is, you, you know, you might speed up one routine by having threads. But you have to spend in the next year, putting OpenMP into all these other hundred routines that you don't really care about, just so they don't run on only one process. And nowadays, I don't cover it, but if you just have your original issue that where you have a large memory overhead per MPI process and limited system memory, it's actually very simple in MPI to, to share. There's a concept of MPI shared memory. You can do a global, you, you can create M shared memory on a node between MPI processes. Which solves your problem straight away without having to do all this. So I, so I, I, I've been criticised for this, but I think MPI plus OpenMP is a disgusting and horrible model, and it has an enormous number of. So you know, I would, I wouldn't go there personally, but I know a lot of people disagree. I would now, I would go, I would. It's a bit more complicated syntax, but I would go the um, shared memory MPI model, which is incremental. 
it's basically the MP plus open plea isn't incremental because once you've made the choice to go MP plus open MP, you run your MPI program on one core per node. So it has a global effect. MPI shared memory allows you to say when this routine, well, I think of the MPI process as being processed on one threads. So you can you can mix and match. So uh, I don't know if that answered your question. I don't think there's a memory balance argument. In fact, it might be reverted that the memory usage is more efficient in MPI than MPI. Sorry, not memory usage, memory bandwidth is maximized in MPI programs compared to an MP program. So, um, well, thanks for the interesting questions. I hope you, you found it useful. Uh, Claire will be, okay. So Jacob says, I'm parallel I related to question. My MPI process is first write file, heat process writes a separate file, then the files are closed. Then I'd like all the process to be able to read any of the files, even though it's written by other processes. I naively put MPI routes in two or three, it doesn't really help. Sometimes the only file is created by another project fails. I can't hear. So, so this is the so um, I said that you that you rarely that you never need MPI barriers for correctness in an MPI program. What I meant was you never need MPI barriers in a program where where for correctness or almost never, where all communication is done through MPI. Of course, here you have a case where you're doing communications which isn't done through MPI. You're doing communications. Um, you're doing, you have an alternative backdoor communication route, which is by files. So unfortunately here you have two communication routes. One is direct MPI to MPI communication, and the other is indirect communication via files. And so um, you're saying that you do a barrier, but um, it doesn't, the files are closed. I think the problem here is that you'll have, I'm not a file system expert, but, but um, You've got some shared so, so you've got some shared file system here, and you know there will be some delay. Um, so when I you know you do MPI barrier, so you open a file, you write it, you close it, you do MPI barrier. So that means in time, after the barrier it is guaranteed that all the files have been closed. But that doesn't mean they've appeared on the external disk because there'll be any amount of buffering. So it may take some time. For the file to appear on on the external disk, so um, I think that if you use so, I think if you used MPI IO, no, so I've never done. And you could try. Mm, there may be some OS, there may be some operating system call to say, look, I really, really want this file to be written to disk. Um, but um, what's this? What's this like? So what you want to do is you want to a way to guarantee that the, the, the data has been written, actually appeared to dip, appear on disk. And the problem is that, I mean, the basic problem is writing to disk is very slow. So modern file systems don't try not to write to disk. And if you write a file on a modern laptop, it doesn't write to disk, it keeps it in memory. And only puts it to disk, you know, you open a file, write it, close it, it's not gonna be on the disk, it's gonna be in memory. On a single on a single laptop, that's fine. But if another process opens the file, the operating system knows that the file is in memory, not on disk. When you have multiple operating systems, then that's where the problem is, that one of the files is still lit lit sitting in the, the, it could be a, a memory cache or a local disk cache of one of the nodes, and the other node doesn't know that. So um, it depends what file system it is. There, there must be ways, there'll be file system dependent ways of flushing to disk. Um, you could use MPIIO. MPIIO probably has, Probably has more strict semantics about 
the file actually appearing on disk. But I'm not, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that you have to have some operating specific, well, so as MPIO is very, you need some operating specific, specific or actually file system specific command to say, look, I really, really, really want you to write this to the, this disk, okay? Now, that's gonna be a, a nightmare to try and find out, but, if you use MPIIO, hopefully they've already worked that out. So what I need to do is I need to find out if closing a file in MPIIO guarantees it's flushed to disk. So yeah, so so the other key to say, could you could you not avoid writing to disk? So yes, often I mean, um, is why you? So I guess okay. So the answer to, to to anyone who says they have a file I.O. problem is always to say, do you really need to write to file? Which is what Keith is saying here. Could you not use one of the MPI processes in the data store and grab what data you needed from that? So how big are these files? Okay, As Keith said, one per node. So, so that, you know, that is a, you know, you can, um, there are ways to find, you know, you can nominate one, one guy per, so you can keep it in memory uh, and, um, um, yeah. Well, anyone to read any file? Yeah, I think uh, the simplest, I mean, I think the long-term approach is what Keith is, is suggesting here is to, is to circumvent the need to write the file. But I think the short, I'll, I'll look up if I, I'll look up what, um, um, what the semantics of MPIIO are, because it might be a quick and a quick and easy win. What are these files? Are they just data? Are they Fortran or C? Are they raw data files? Are they formatted files? Are they HDF five or something trendy like that? Custom binary files. Okay, so if they're just by as a C program, you are you writing in C or Fortran? Sorry, sorry, C. Okay, so so yeah, if they're binary files written from C, then that's probably, although the long-term solution is, is along the lines of what Keith is suggesting, it's possible the short-term solution. How big is your program? How, how? well, no, I, what I'll do, I'll, I'll look up the semantics of MPIIO. That might be a quick and, yeah, I'll look it up. Because MPIIO has the concept of, 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 File I/O being done within a communicator, so you know you might. I'm sure you might be able to say at this point, please make sure all files within this communicator were. Um, so you can do one. Yeah, you know, there's there, there's a there's a routine called. Let's go. Let's. Uh, lost my cursor again. I get back to uh, sharing. Should be this guy coming up now. What you want is uh, MPI com type. So, I, if you were here, I, I mentioned there's really an MPI called split, which could which could split. Which had a coloring idea. You, you, you colored the process as red, green, blue with a number, and it was split. Mm -hmm. MPI com split type splits communicate based on type. It currently only supports one type, which is MPI com node. But if you want to create a separate communicator per node, what you do is you call MPI com split type, and you specify uh, the split type as being MPI com node. I think. And it does it all for you. Uh, previously, you had to do horrible things like every I, every node would work out what its name was. And if I was called Node Fifty Three, and it, it, it's supported. So, but I think I think that I think that actually there's a, that the MPIIO, although MPIIO, in my mind, is really um, MPIIO in my mind is really there to allow you to write 
a single file collectively from a large number of processes. In my mind, that's its, its unique selling feature, USP selling point, that you can, you can create a single, single output file from a thousand processes and you never even knew it was produced in parallel not producing a thousand single files however as a side effect of it being a collective um or or, or, or mpi aware library it's perfectly possible that your uh inter-process file synchronization issues could be solved by using mpio so i'm going to try and follow that up that was an interesting question so just want jacob what machine are you running on <coughs> Yeah, so I think this would work on Archer because Archer has a, a bespoke parallel file system. So I think Archer would would know that the file had been closed. But on a, a Linux cluster where you're you're probably just using NFS or some some distributed, not a parallel file system, distributed file system, which has much looser semantics. You know, it, it doesn't have such consistency. Guarantees I, I can see the issue you're getting. Um, and what you're encountering is the same issue that when you, if, if you're using a USB stick on your laptop, yeah, you save a file from USB, you can't pull the USB out because you've saved a file, it hasn't really saved the file, it's still sitting in memory. You have to say safely disconnect USB. That's where the file system is. Oops, I better flush all that stuff to file because what files a good file system never writes to file. That's 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 how it works. It just writes to local memory and only puts it to file when it really, really finally needs to do it, which works for a single operating system. But the problem is the MPI model has multiple operating systems, and you'll, you'll see exactly the issues. You see that one operating system, process and operating system A, doesn't know that the, the file on operating system B is, it has, has not been written. The disk is still sitting in memory or in some intermediate disk storage or something like that. Okay, that's a very interesting question. So, um, if there's no more questions, they were that they were very that very interesting. I'll so I'll sign off now. Thanks very much. Bye.